Welcome to the Quarantine Tapes, a daily podcast from Onassis, LA, and Dublin. Hosted by Paul Holden Graber, this series chronicles shifting paradigms in the era of social distancing. Hello, could I please speak with Slavo Zizek? Yes, I'm here. Slavoj, what a pleasure to speak to you. This is Paul Holdengraber calling you from the quarantine tape. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me. Tell me, where do I find you? Or are you in Slovenia? Yes, but in Slovenia, this stupid rhythm that you also had in the United States was much stronger. By this, I mean it was intense panic. End of March, beginning of April. And then early May, Slovenia was even stupid enough to officially proclaim the end of pandemics. People were going out, everything was open. And you know what's so paradoxical that now we had more new infections every day than in the worst period of the first wave. But people somehow are in a panic, but at the same time, they are not taking it seriously. Do you have the same with you? People reject, refuse to take it serious. I mean, how can you be in a panic and not worried? I mean, I know that your your most recent book, which came up, came out maybe uh, uh, yeah. two months ago, Panic, Pandemic, COVID-19 Shakes the World. H- how can you explain being in a panic and not taking that seriously? It's easy. You know, I will repeat an old joke of mine that I often use, but it fits here perfectly. It's an old European joke from World War I, then that in 1917, when things began to get worse for the central axis, they sent from Berlin, German headquarters to Vienna, to Austrian headquarters, a short telegram with us, the situation on the battlefield is serious, but not catastrophic. The answer from Vienna was, with us, the situation is catastrophic, but not serious. (laughs) And I think this is the everyday attitude. Literally, I mean it. They rationally accept that there is a catastrophe, but somehow they don't take it seriously. Because first, you don't see anything. This uh, virus is invisible. So you go out, you see people, uh, you see the sun, everything is green and so on. And you ask yourself, what if all of this is just a bluff? The second thing, this taking it easy has another dimension. When you speak with people a little bit longer, I noticed this, the true message you get is, we all know there will be a catastrophe later in the winter. So let's enjoy it as long as we can. You know, it's a little bit of this, that carpe diem, enjoy the day, but as long as you can. On the other hand, we still get, it's not just the United States, also in Europe, in my own country, in Slovenia, many, how should I call them, COVID deniers, you know, they simply think if they are leftist or even some kind of liberal right-wingers, that this is a big plot of the state to establish full control over us or that it's a plot of big pharmaceutical companies or whatever you want and so on and so on. You are not the only ones, by I mean United States, with your, how do you call that, QAnon or whatever. We have our own QAnons or similar things. And yet we, we will we will talk about the ways in which maybe the pandemic has brought into focus ways in which we are controlled. But before I get to that, you've written that to make it out of this pandemic, Slavoj, you said we yes. will have to experience a true philosophical revolution. What does that really mean? I will try to be as precise as possible. I use here... The term philosophy, not in an elaborate technical sense, guys who write big, fat 
uh, books incomprehensible to ordinary people, but you know, Hegel knew it. All great philosophers knew it. There is some truth in the sense that when when somebody tells you, uh, you know, my philosophy is to take things like this, or my basic view of life is, and so on and so on, this everyday self-understanding. I claim that the only way to properly understand the impact of pandemic is that it affects us also at this level of our basic self-understanding. So I don't just laugh at the people who are against, for example, wearing masks, claiming not be like a dog, that weird creature there, behaving according to the rules, as the rules demand of us in in uh, the pandemic. They claim it's simply against my understanding of what does it mean to be a free human being, some dignity. In this sense, I mean philosophy, not writing new books, but as already Heidegger, not everybody's uh, uh, favorite guy today, but nonetheless a great philosopher, said that the origin of philosophy is the hermeneutics, understanding of our daily life. When you talk with other people, when you say, but you are not free, what do we mean by freedom? Is just freedom of choice or whatsoever? When you say, but this is real, what do you mean by reality? And I think that that's why the pandemic also has a tremendous psychic impact. People don't talk enough about that one. They talk about how is it linked with ecology, with economic crisis, and so on, with this anti-racism protest. But I think maybe even the greatest danger is that of our basic self-understanding. In some sense, we will know whatever happens, and I don't think things will happen. In some sense, we will have to renounce some of the basic components, features of what for us it means to be a free, dignified, and so on human being. Such as what? what Such as what? What will we have to renounce? Basically, it's it's notion of personal freedom, having a private space, socializing, uh, and so on. But here, as I wrote already, things are a little bit more complex. Namely, I don't like when some social scientists and commentators just emphasize how before they were living, we were living a full social life. Now we are isolated, social distancing, and so on and so on. We are physically sometimes more isolated. In the social space of digital control and so on, we are more transparent, open than ever. So it's not, we are also, it's not just we are reduced to our privacy. No, we are, our privacy is at the same time invaded. Zlavoj, this is a perfect follow-up to what I'd like to ask you about. You've, yeah. you've been interested in technologies like Neuro, Neuralink and, yeah. and the prospect that we may soon enter what they call a post-human state. You quote yeah. something that gave me truly shivers, chills. Yeah. Elon Musk predicts human language will be obsolete in as little as five years. And then he adds, and then you add, but we could still do it, he says, for sentimental reasons. In a sense, we may have already entered this new world in which our minds are connected to outside (coughs) networks. You recently wrote, what we need now is not only more physical proximity to others, but also more psychic distance from others. Yeah, if you look quickly at my at my book, Hegel in a Wire Brain, you may have noticed this, a very simple, vulgar, but decent, don't be afraid, no dirty words, example that I use, that of erotism. Let's say I'm flirting with somebody, man, woman, doesn't matter, and... Uh, there is a tension between the two of us. As long as we use language, this is, or at least can be, almost the most 
charming part of the process of seduction. You say something, but it has another deeper meaning. And then in this interplay of exchanges, misunderstandings can be very productive. You say something, the other guy or woman, whatever, lady, understand it in a different way, and all of a sudden, passion explodes. But can you just imagine if the two of us, me and an object of possible sexual act or love even, if we were able to somehow directly outside language communicate, be linked our mind to his or her or their mind. There is no seduction process. We look at each other and we immediately make it clear. I would do it with you. Sorry, I wouldn't or whatever. And it's not just this. I subscribe to a theory of language, even advocated by most serious linguists today, that the crucial dimension of language is not only what you say, but what you imply to say. I mean, that's not all, that's vulgar to say. But let me go a step further, that the most productive discoveries often in language, when you invent something new, happen through deadlocks or even mistakes. You do something, you say something slightly different, you make a slip of tongue, and then all of a sudden you discover, but my God, there is more truth in what I said in this slip of tongue than in what I meant. That is to say, language is never what Elon Musk seems to think, just an external medium Oh, uh, uh, a machine for transmission of thoughts which are already in our mind. Our thoughts are just a mess. They don't exist before language. We think in words, literally. Right, and, right. Uh, I want to focus on this dimension in my book. I give the example. I don't even like the movie. You know, the famous love statement of Hugh Grant to Andy McDowell in in uh, four weddings and a funeral. He tries to declare his love to her, but he makes mistakes, mumbles, bumbles, g- uh, gets stuck and so on. But isn't it precisely through this self-sabotage, inability to say clearly what he wants, if he were just to declare clearly what he wants, it would have been robotic, horrible. So I'm asking this question, these questions, even if we abstract from the big technical, more than theoretical problem, can the machine really do it? They are far from it. Like, not just follow general moods. Are you in a good mood, bad mood, and so on? But can they really follow our line of thought? I don't think they can, because as a good semanticist or linguist will tell you, very simply, meaning of what you do is not in your mind, deep in your head. It's outside. It emerges through interaction. And and this moment is, is interesting. No, this moment of the pandemic is interesting insofar that r- being a good semiologist is very hard at this moment because we can't read other people's faces gestures were removed from yes, that. although i don't believe that language is lying in this simple sense that your expressions of face or gestures are truth automatically right i think we are we humans are at a much deeper level lying beings i agree right. here it's not a lacanian eccentricity I refer here to, he's not an idiot, I often read him, Daniel Dennett, who said that language was invented basically to lie. He probably stole that that comment from Stendhal. Stendhal said, nous avons la parole pour cacher nos pensées. We have words so as to hide our thoughts. Yeah, but you, I agree, I agree. But you know where I would nonetheless following my Lacanian dogma, supplement Stendhal, whom I love. I mean, if you ask me, Stendhal is the biggest, even biggest than the line from the three big names, Stendhal, Balzac, Zola. It's a downward line. That's another point. What I want to say is that, and that's the paradox that intrigues me, you find it already in Freud, not only we have language to conceal our thoughts, but 
what we are concealing emerges even in our hand only through being concealed. There is not a pre-existing entity, I really mean this, and then we try to cover it up when we speak to others. That's my old idea that what is concealed? It's not, I want to say this, then to conceal it, I put it in language. What if there is, I always say more than what I wanted to say. And in this translation of the thought to language, another, let's call it deeper unconscious thought emerges. So things get uh, complicated here. But I agree, Stendhal, uh, his book, didn't he wrote a book on love and so on? Also? Yes, yes. Not he, 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 he wrote, he wrote kind of an, uh, an, uh, an essay on, on love. And he, what is so fascinating, Slavoj, is that yes. before he, he sat down every day to write it, he would read uh, some legal texts so that he would keep cool. <laughs> But he couldn't keep cool because he, he was writing about love and he was writing about that moment when one feels a crystallization. But let's not speak too much about Stendhal. Yeah. We'll, we'll, yeah. Keep, we'll, keep, yeah. we'll keep that for another moment. Agreed. How, how, um, uh, uh, Zlavoj, how are you thinking at this moment, uh, during this pandemic, uh, of a concept like state of exception? It seems like all sorts of things are happening while we're distracted. And I'm, I'm thinking, as I ask you about the state of exception, I'm thinking of that wonderful line in Benjamin Fondan about Hegel, where he say, says, Hegel in his history had thought of everything but surprises. Oh, my God. Okay, let's not go now into it, because me as a Hegelian, no, I claim that Hegel precisely is nothing his thought, but a systematization of surprises. One big premise of Hegel, of his history of philosophy, philosophy of history and so on, is surprise. In what sense? For example, that's Hegel's dogma for me. You take a big event that everybody or most of the enlightened people celebrates, like let's take uh, 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 the French Revolution, freedom, equality, and so on. Then you are surprised, my God, it's the revolutionary terror. You say, oh, but I didn't want that. It's a surprise. Hegel's answer, no. What interests me is precisely how surprises like this emerge. Hegelian dogma is that somehow things always take a wrong turn. Or for me, Hegel, if he were to live in the 20th century, it would be a continuous intellectual orgasm for him. For example, second half of the 19th century, it was, although there was war on other continents, but for Western Europe, or all of Europe, it was basically a long period of peace and relative progress. You know, you had progress in human rights, women, getting the right to vote, healthcare, retire, slowly things were progressing. And then you got first the Great War, First World War, absolute shock. Nobody believed that it could happen, although some intelligent guys predicted it, but that's another point. Or take, for example, disintegration of communism, 1990. Hegel would have been pleasure predicted how where Fukuyama was wrong. Okay, it was in some sense the end of history. We appeared to imagine to, or at least to come close to what is the ultimate, the highest possible balance of freedom, social order, and so on with liberal capitalist democracy. But then we got whatever you want. We got, we got uh, terror attacks, we got new waves of fundamentalism, and so on, and so on. So I think that Hegel's system in some sense is this type of a system of surprises. Or, of course, Hegel's example, so that I'm not just uh, uh, criticizing the right. Hegel would have been intrigued in what sense communism, which nonetheless was an idea of total actual freedom and so on, ended up when taking power in Soviet Union in almost the worst imaginable form of totalitarian terror. 
tax the Hegelians. But but, but what, what what are you, what are you thinking about when you're thinking about state of exception at this moment? Uh, well, it's not it's not a new idea, and no. uh, we know that Agamben is preaching this for 20 years, even more, no? But what I think is that, okay, it may sound a little bit too, uh, not sophisticated, but sophistic. I think that all that we are afraid of today, most of state control and so on and so on, but they were already going on fully, not just in China. I'm a little bit suspicious of this eternal focus on China, what they are doing there. With us also, we learned through WikiLeaks and others how all our phone conversations, uh, emails and so on, uh, were made available to state agencies or even to private agencies and so on and so on. I think that COVID just made us aware or rendered more visible something which was already going on before. I don't think our freedom, except in the most external way, like when there is a quarantine, you cannot move. But I don't think our freedom was substantially curtailed. It just re revealed it more. The society, our societies only became more openly that what they already were. What complicates things is already the fact that conservatives in Europe also, they are much more opposed to this control measures, social distancing, masks and so on, than the leftists. This is interesting yeah. how yeah. those whom we use, like take Trump and so on. You know, although Trump is a specific type of, I know, populist, a conservative. But I don't like to jump to these quick conclusions. I think that one of the effects of COVID was the gap between the rich and the poor is stronger. Racial uh, oppression and the oppression of women exploitation at least got stronger and so on and so on. This leads me to to my my final question to you, uh, sad, yeah. sadly, Slavoj. Uh, Julian Assange is currently on trial in the United Kingdom in a yeah. in a case with enormous implications for freedom of press. Who or what exactly yeah. would you say is on trial? I think if you ask me, I do that. He yeah that that. He disturbed or touched the raw nerve of social control today, before pandemic, before COVID and so on. Our, what I call, following Marx, our commons, our shared space, space within which we communicate. And today, this social space, commons, is dominated by digital media. It's, uh, on the one hand, this digital media, but also other phones and so on, are the media of freedom. People can directly communicate with each other, bypassing some central authority. At the same time, if they are controlled by state agencies, we come close to almost some form of direct mind control. So if I may use an old-fashioned Marxist expression, I think that the struggle for who will control this media, new digital media, new digital commons is maybe the crucial aspect of, haha, sorry for the expression, class struggle today. It's one of the big struggles today. Have you, have you That's why it's not just about Assange. No. It's not so about just revenge, about what he did. It's an intervention into the big struggle today. That's why I asked you who is on trial and uh, what is on trial. And I, I suppose that what is on trial is also a deep understanding of what freedom of press really means. Yes, yes. But as a philosopher, exactly. I would have said it's too simple to say freedom is on trial. I think what is on trial is our awareness more and more. There can also be, let's call it, False freedom. As I often wrote, the true danger for me is not unfreedom for which you obviously see that it's 
on freedom. Like in China, everybody knows they are controlled. You even sometimes, a friend of mine told me, you turn your head, you see behind you a policeman following you. The problem with controlling our cyberspace and so on is that you experience yourself as almost totally free. You surf the web, you exchange messages, almost anything goes. But precisely in what you experience as the exercise of your freedom, you are totally controlled. Your non-freedom itself is experienced as your freedom. And I think that that was rendered visible by Assange. That was his central message. I visited him, and I don't know if you know the story, it's my favorite story, which tells us a lot. I used it in a text. I visited him just before pandemic in January in prison, and we sat at a table, and one of his friends who was with me went for a cup of coffee with for me, cappuccino or what, and bring a plastic cup with cover, no? So I opened up the cover, drank a little bit, sitting at a table with Assange, the where there were many other prisoners, and then I put the cup of coffee on the table. Immediately, I mean in one or two seconds, a gentleman of the guard came to me and said very politely, please cover cover your cup of coffee with the plastic cover. And afterwards, I asked him why. He said, because Assange is a dangerous person and we wanted to protect you. He may have grabbed the cup of hot coffee and threw it into, throw it into your face. You see, that's the atmosphere. Everything is very nicely done, human, but they, the way they treat him, you know, they also, now he cannot even see his two children and their mother. He cannot properly talk with his lawyers, never alone. All for protecting him. Now it's against COVID. Before, it was a wonderful excuse. The idea was that since he is so much hated by many patriots, Western, somebody may have attacked him if he mingled too much with other prisoners and so on. It's really, it's not an exaggeration. He is getting half crazy, a kind of psychological torture. And the, and the danger there is that um, other journalists, other people in the media will keep themselves from doing the kind of work he did. Absolutely. You know the old story about Jews. First, the people said, sorry, in Germany. First, it's just the Jews. It doesn't concern me. But then came communists, then came social democrats, and at the end it was everybody, you know. So I think, effectively, it's not really about Assange, although there are obviously elements of how democrats who still consider him the main reason for Trump, one of the main reasons for Trump winning uh, won their revenge, but basically it's a message to all of us. Lavoj, it's been a real pleasure to speak to you. Stay safe, and I hope that before long we see each other again. Let me tell you something to conclude very sad. Usually I was telling this when I was on Zoom or phone with them to my American friends. But now we are in the same situation here in Europe. You know that Madrid, it looks, it will get a total quarantine again. London, my country is approaching panic. So that's so horrible about COVID. You think it's getting easier. And then it, it's like a living death, which returns again and again, you know. So we should all keep safe. Keep safe, please. And see you soon, somehow. I some, hope so. I some, hope so. Somehow, somewhere, sometime soon. Take care, Slavoj. I, you know what my dream from Ernst Lubitsch in hell? But I always dream that there are nice places in hell. Not too close to burning oil, to just far enough so that you are still warm, but you can enjoy life there. I think we will meet in a nice place in hell, but you know where life is more comfortable and so on. No? See you in hell. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> bye bye, then. To support this show and Dublab's progressive programming, go to dublab.com/support.